Good afternoon. Glad you're here. This is our child safety, child protection class intended for adults to understand some of the serious implications of and responsibilities of our uh, protecting our children. My name is Don Yancheson. I'm the pastor from the Murphy and Andrews churches in North Carolina. And I had the unfortunate uh, responsibility <laughs> in a previous, two previous districts of dealing with uh, pedophiles within my church. Uh, one of them was the, one of our church members and uh, unfortunately he molested his nine-year-old daughter and was uh, grooming one of the neighbor kids. So in the process of ministering to him in jail and uh, some of the other things involved in that, I uh, learned a lot about child protection and the importance of it. So before we begin, Let's have a word of prayer. Father God, I want to thank you for this opportunity to learn about protecting our children. I want to thank you that you've made provisions for our children. We know that there's a lot of, uh, a lot of things going on in the world that are threats to children of all ages. And I pray that you will be with us and uh, give us understanding and knowledge, but also wisdom to apply these things in a way that will keep our children safe and keep us safe as well. So bless us and be with us through your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Child abuse is a significant problem in the United States and our culture today. When we look at the statistics, there's an average of 6 million reports of child abuse and neglect each year, which involves almost 6 million children. And these are reports that are made to child protective agencies throughout uh, the country. So we're talking about a major problem affecting a lot of children. Currently, 10 out of every 1,000 children in the United States are victims of some child maltreatment, whether it be sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse. 10 out of 1,000 is uh, an incredibly large figure when we're dealing with child abuse. Each year, over 1,500 children die in the United States because of child abuse. This is a graph and I, the line's not showing on there. It's also, as of 2007, they haven't uh, got up to date with their statistics yet. They're just now working on the 2008 statistics. But these are the number of child deaths per day as a result of uh, child abuse and neglect. So you can see in 1995, three children a day were dying in the United States as a result of child abuse. Now we're up to almost five a day. So it's an increasing problem. It's one that is not going away, unfortunately. But there is this constant tread of, uh, trend of uh, child abuse in our country. Three out of four children who died as a result of abuse or neglect are under the age of four years old. And that is sad. National abuse statistics. One in four girls and one in six boys are sexually abused before the age of 18. That's 25% of the girls being sexually abused. The median age for reporting child abuse is nine years old. Nearly 70% of all reported sexual assaults are on children ages 17 and under. And according to the Department of Justice, there are over 40 million survivors of child sexual abuse in America today. And these are all children that uh, range from teenage to adult and are suffering the consequences of the child abuse, the sexual abuse that uh, they experienced when they were younger. The number of cases of child abuse and neglect that were investigated in 2008, and unfortunately, I don't have any more current uh, figures. In the state of Georgia, 77,466 cases of child abuse and neglect uh, that were investigated. 99,000 in Tennessee, 139,000 in North Carolina. Now, North Carolina isn't necessarily worse than the other two states. They have a different way of recording, which ends up counting more of these cases than Georgia and Tennessee do. Depending on the state, 20 to 50 percent of the investigated cage cases of child abuse and neglect are substantiated. That means when they've investigated them, they have found out that these were actually cases of child abuse. So 20 to 50 percent of those cases actually turned out to be real neglect, abuse, or sexual abuse. For example, of the 77,000 cases investigated in Georgia, 
26,000 were substantiated. That's in one year, 2008, 26,000 cases of children being abused in some way. Again, it's a, it's a serious problem. Child abuse occurs at every socioeconomic level, across ethnic, ethnic and cultural lines, within all religions, and at all levels of education. So it doesn't matter where the children come from, what their background is, uh, they're not exempt from child abuse. Children who have been sexually abused are two and a half times more likely to abuse alcohol. These are some of the effects of uh, abuse. Children who have been sexually abused are 3.8 times more likely to develop drug addictions. Nearly two-thirds of the people in treatment for drug abuse reported being abused as children. That's a significant figure. Abused children are 25% more likely to experience teen pregnancy. There are a lot of factors that enter into that, but uh, promiscuity and so forth are uh, things that result from uh, particularly child sexual abuse. Melissa Huckabee, nice sweet girl next door type. You wouldn't think there would be an issue there. She was a 28 year old Sunday school teacher. She sexually molested and strangled eight-year-old so eight Sandra Contu with a noose in a church in March of 2009. And the reason I showed that is we typically think of males being the ones who uh, will sexually abuse a child. But there's a growing number of women as well. And when we're looking at protecting our children from uh, predatory pedophiles and so forth, we need to be aware that it's not just a male problem, that it's a female problem as well. While men commit most sexual abuse, women commit between 14 and 40 percent of offenses reported against boys and 6 percent of the offenses against girls. And that 14 to 40 depends on the reporting and different states determine uh, different things as being abuse. Come on in. The purpose of this seminar, Child Safety and Protection, is to protect our children. Of course, that is uh, critically important. We want to be able to provide a safe environment for our children. We want to uh, provide proper supervision and protection for our children in all of our activities, whether it's Sabbath school or Pathfinders or whatever it may be. We want to protect them from outside influence, from people coming in and being a threat to them, but we also need to protect them from threats from within the church environment. Unfortunately, over the years, there have been uh, people within our churches, good upstanding citizens, uh, leaders in the church, people that uh, no one would suspect being a problem, and yet over time we would find out that uh, they had been molesting numerous children in the churches. Uh, one case uh, even involved a man who had been an elder in the church for uh, decades. And uh, when they finally caught him, he had molested about 45 children. So we have threats within our church, and we need not to be naive about that. We need to be aware because it is a problem. And we need to protect the children from outside influence and dangers. We had one situation when I was, uh, it was a big city church, Omaha, and we had a gentleman that started coming to church, uh, seemed like a real nice guy, but I started noticing that he seemed to be hanging around the children a little bit too much. And during Sabbath school, he'd be hanging around outside, his, uh, outside their Sabbath school classrooms. So I asked the deacons to kind of keep an eye on him and uh, just to see what he was uh, doing. And they were watching him, I was watching him, other people were watching him. But, uh, one day I was walking down the hall downstairs in between Sabbath school and worship service and uh, saw him go into a classroom. And he had pinned uh, one of the young girls, about a seven-year-old girl, into that classroom. Had I not gone in and caught him, we don't know what would have happened, but a couple of deacons came in and they held him till the police came and we had him arrested. So we've got to be careful in our churches. There are threats from the outside. There are threats inside as well. We just need to be aware of those. The second thing is to protect our adults. It's very important because uh, these days of uh, heavy litigation and people being paranoid, there are false accusations being placed on adults 
even suspicions if somebody sees something and they misinterpret it and uh, they go and report an adult for doing something that they might not have done. We need to be especially careful. So we need to protect our adults that are teachers, Sabbath school teachers, uh, school teachers, whatever they may be, uh, leading with our youth, that uh, we keep them safe as well. And we don't want people to being falsely accused. And another important thing we want to look at in this seminar is uh, we've got to protect our church. There have been a lot of cases of litigation. I don't know the figures, but I know Adventist Risk Management has paid out a tremendous amount of money in uh, cases against employees of the denomination, people within the churches, because of allegations of uh, sexual abuse or child abuse in general. So our church is taking this very serious and it's something that uh, we'll be hearing more and more about. But going back a ways, all the way to 1997, the uh, church, the uh, General Conference, uh, issued a statement on child sexual abuse that uh, explained what it was, and I believe in our handouts uh, we have some of those. And uh, we'll get you a copy of that and you can take a look at it. But it lays out what the threats are, and what the stand of the church is. And basically, it's a zero tolerance policy when it comes to abuse. Yeah, if you want to, they're over on the table now. Okay. Thank you. They also produced in 2005, 2006 guidelines, and you may have seen these. These are volunteer screening guidelines for children and youth ministries. We have a copy of that, and it's something you need to be aware of. There's also other things that are uh, dealing with volunteer codes and so forth that uh, are very helpful for us in understanding this. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is committed to providing a safe environment to help children learn to love and follow Jesus Christ. The records show the disturbing and traumatic increase of physical and sexual abuse of children has claimed the attention of our nation, our society, and the church. Adventist churches and schools which conduct programs for children and youth are not insulated from those individuals who abuse kids. So the church is acknowledging that there is a potential problem there. We need to be aware of it and we need to take the necessary precautions. The Seventh-day Adventist Church desires to make its worship and educational environments free from abuse of all kinds. To achieve this goal in its ministry and educational programs, the following guidelines have been developed for the implementation throughout the North American Division. So this is the working, a portion of the working policy of 2005-2006. Little cartoon here to lighten things up a bit. I'm sorry, but having to eat broccoli twice a week is not child abuse. Okay. For some children, that is child abuse. Children don't know what child abuse is. And we'll talk more about that instead when we talk about uh, the types of abuse. Most children don't know what abuse is. Adults, especially predatory pedophiles, are very astute at doing things in such a way that the child feels comfortable until they are actually in an abusive situation. And... Uh, Yeah, and, and they get that at Child Protective Services sometimes too. But they don't understand what abuse is, and to them, anything that goes against what they want to do is abuse, and all the other things aren't. And the pedophiles will work on those things that aren't and turn them around into something that they can utilize. So we'll talk more about that. Child abuse, here's a definition for you, and it's on your uh, class notes uh, that you have there. There's a couple pages. Child abuse is defined as the physical, emotional, or sexual abuse or neglect of children by parents, guardians, or other adults that are responsible for them. So that pretty much covers anybody who does anything to, to a child, okay? So we're dealing with physical abuse, but we're also dealing with emotional abuse. And we need to be aware of that in our churches, in church environments. Uh, putting children down, uh, making fun of them, allowing other children to make fun of them. That's all abuse. It's emotional abuse, and it can be uh, long-term damage done in what seems to be something very simple. Um, sexual abuse, of course, that is an issue, a major issue. Child sexual abuse is defined as sexual abuse of a child by an adult or some other person significantly older or in a position of power 
or control over the child, where the child is used for sexual stimulation or satisfaction of another person. It's a whole lot of dynamics to go into uh, these uh, pet predatory pedophiles and sexual offenders and so forth as to why they do it and so forth, and that's not something that we have time to deal with here, nor am I qualified, but uh, there are a lot of reasons for these things to happen. And uh, in child sexual abuse, it's not always sexual. It's a matter of control so, and power. So there's a lot of issues there. Uh, so we can't just be looking for things that uh, are obvious or apparent um, suggestions and so forth because that may not be what is actually taking place. Again, these pedophiles are uh, involved in a power and control issue and they are working in ways of manipulation that, uh, uh, in the more experienced ones, in ways that it's very hard for even trained people to spot. Child sexual abuse includes inappropriate touching, rubbing, hugging, and fondling. It is not just molestation, it's not just rape, and a lot of people think that uh, child sexual abuse is a matter of actual rape or uh, some kind of penetration, but child sexual abuse involves inappropriate touching, rubbing, and so forth, uh, inappropriate hugging. There's nothing wrong with hugging, but there is inappropriate hugging as well. Janice, come over here and use you for a guinea pig for a moment. Okay. <laughs> this is an appropriate hug for child or an adult. Okay. Side to side is the best. I have church members and especially children that will come up to me in a full frontal embrace and I'll just sit there and you know, stand there and I'll just turn them sideways and hug them this way. If you find yourself in a frontal embrace, this is my wife so I do this. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's a leaning embrace okay, where we are separating the lower parts of our body. It's not, you know, you may have to get way out there, but just enough where you're actually not making contact. This is appropriate hugging for adults. It's appropriate hugging for children as well. So the best is side to side, and uh, if it's a front to front, then at least there's some separation. It's difficult with little children. I had one five-year-old just come up and clamp onto my leg. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. So you just kind of gently move them over to the side and give them a hug. And I usually kneel down or stoop down and give them a hug that way. So got to be discreet. But they, they don't understand. To them, that's, that's perfectly okay. When a five-year-old came up and hugged the pedophile that I'd been working with, then I'm real concerned. And that's how she clamped onto him. So, you know, that, that is an issue. So, uh, exposure of any kind of uh, genitals, molestation, any kind of uh, you know, sexual touching, rubbing, and so forth. And then rape comes in, in into that factor as well. So, these are all things that are included in sexual abuse. It's not just rape. Well, sometimes we have to think, too, you know, if a child's doing something that's inappropriate, where did they learn that from? Is it something that any child would do, or is it something that's out of the ordinary? Okay. You know? And when we're watching our children, we need to be aware that maybe this is not normal, or this is something that raises some red flags or some concern, and it might be worthwhile to, to check into it to find that this is not a normal behavior for a child of that age. Because we'll talk about it in a moment, but uh, the results of abuse manifest themselves in different ways. Taking pornographic pictures and videos, that is a big, big problem today. Uh, children are being photographed, they're being plastered all over the internet. The police and the FBI are working frantically to try to get this under control and it's just exploding faster than they can uh, even keep track of it. So this is also child sexual abuse. Non-physical sexual abuse includes inappropriate suggestions, innuendos, Jokes. Standing there telling an off-color joke in front of a child is considered child sexual abuse. I mean, we don't usually think of that, or just making little suggestions and so forth. Uh, gestures, foul gestures, pictures and movies showing a child lewd pictures, inviting them to watch movies and so forth, that comes into the pornographic area. And it is uh, non-sexual, non-physical, but it's still sexual abuse. We had, uh, under gestures, 
we had one gentleman, he was the director of a Pathfinder Club, and they were having a Christmas party. And the teenage girls that were there, everybody was having fun at a house, and he brings some mistletoe out and he's holding it over the teenage girls to get kissed. Mm -hmm. yeah, most of the people, fine. most his of the people, his wife thought it was fine. The other people, the other adults who were there, they didn't think anything about it. The girls were saying, no, get away from me, yick, and, you know, and all kinds of things like that, but he's still chasing them around with that. That is child sexual abuse. Okay? But the adults didn't think anything about it. Negative consequences of, a chi of child abuse on a child, the physical effects that uh, impact them, that can... Uh, Things that could result in death, lifelong health problems. There can be cognitive uh, difficulties, physical disabilities that uh, to result from this. There are the emotional effects, negative consequences. These include low, low self-esteem, uh, depression, anxiety. A lot of times eating disorders are the result of uh, sexual abuse as a child. We had uh, a couple of church members uh, I felt so bad for him. The one weighed 550 pounds and the other one was 470 pounds. Uh, this is large women. And we come to find out that their father had molested them as uh, children. So a lot of times uh, unusual weight gain and also some of the eating disorders are the result of uh, previous sexual abuse. Um, relationship difficulties in the future, alienation and withdrawal, and even personality disorders can result from someone being um, abused, not just sexually, but in any way. And then the behavioral effects, these include problems in school, problems in work in the future, uh, delinquency, teen pregnancy, attempted suicide or successful suicides, criminal or antisocial behavior, substance abuse is a very uh, uh, high on the list of uh, behavioral effects from uh, child abuse. Aggressive behavior, spousal and child abuse, and anger. Unfortunately, when a child is abused, when they grow up, they tend to project that abuse onto somebody else. If a child watches the father slap the mother around, he's more likely to slap women around when um, he uh, becomes an adult. And this just keeps getting passed on and passed on and passed on. What are appropriate touch and behaviors? We need not to be paranoid about these things, so we need to know what is good, what is okay. Personal space is very important. When you put your arm out and go around in a circle, that space belongs to you. And nobody has the right to enter that space unless they ask your permission or you allow them to come in. Have you ever had somebody walk right up to your face and start talking to you? What do you want to do? You want to back up, you feel uncomfortable, you feel threatened, okay? That's because they entered your personal space without permission, they are too close. So we need to respect that for adults and for children. That is personal space. So we don't go into even a child's personal space without some indication that it's okay. If we're doing something with a child, they say, no, leave me alone, we need to back off, okay? Because that could be uh, ultimately construed as child abuse. So we've got a personal space and we have a right to protect that. Okay? We also have a responsibility to protect that personal space in other people. Respecting privacy, uh, very important, especially with teenagers. We had a situation where uh, it was after worship service and we're getting ready to go on a hike. One of our teenage boys went into a Sabbath school classroom, had the lights off, he was going to change his clothes. And uh, one of our uh, ladies at a different church walked into the, the classroom and went into the closet and getting stuff, and talking to him while he's standing there in his underwear feeling very uncomfortable you know, wrestling to get his pants on. It's child abuse. It could be construed legally as child sexual abuse for invading his privacy. It's common sense stuff, really. Okay. Hand-holding. Hand-holding's okay. Little children walking across the street, walking them down the hall to go to a classroom. Uh, you know, situations like that. All of that is uh, appropriate. However, a male adult holding a 13-year-old girl's hand and walking down the hall is not appropriate, okay? So again, this is common sense. This is stuff that 
we just uh, need to think about a little bit before we do that. Appropriate hugs, again, those are okay. Lap sitting for younger children. It's okay if a toddler comes up, sits on your lap. Once they get up to about uh, four or five years old, you want to kind of start shying away from letting them sit on your lap. Um, I walked into a classroom one time and uh, had 12 year old boys sitting on 16 year old girls' laps. Okay, this is not a good situation. The reason I'm sharing these things is nobody has a clue. The adults don't have a clue, the kids don't have a clue that this stuff is wrong. It's abuse and it needs to be watched. So this is, this is happening in your churches. Okay? And we need to be aware of that. We also need to educate people and help them to understand the importance of protecting our children. Reassuring or affirming touches on the shoulder or back. This is a good thing. You want to encourage a child, teenager, it doesn't matter. Just putting your hand on their back, on their shoulder, especially maybe if they're having some difficult times and you put their, your hand on the shoulder. You don't want to embrace them in a hug, but just a, a reassuring hand on the shoulder um, or the back. That's okay. okay. Touch for hygiene or health. Obviously, you know, changing a baby's diaper and so forth is necessary. Um, the older the kids get, the more you have to be cautious with dealing with clothing. Okay? You never want to uh, take clothing off of a child under any circumstances except changing a baby's diaper and only then if there's another adult there with you or the parents have given you specific permission to do that. Uh, it's for your protection. Smirking or non-smirking, sex education film. Young kids don't know again what is appropriate and what is not appropriate. The prepubescent uh, boys especially think this sex stuff is uh, funny. You know, it's, it's something to, to smirk at and joke about and so forth. Uh, little girls come up and kiss little boys and it's usually yuck, you know, you give me cooties or whatever. Uh, they don't understand this. When an adult does it to them, they understand it even less. They think it's okay because they trust adults, because they believe that the adults are there to protect them. But the younger kids, especially, uh, really don't know when something is being done to them that's inappropriate, unless someone has taught them uh, certain basic precautions. Inappropriate touches and behaviors, coercion of any kind. This includes forcing a child to do something that they don't, they don't want to do. Um, sometimes, it, you know, when you're dealing with disciplinary issues and so forth, especially in schools or in Sabbath school classes or whatever child ministries that you might be involved in, um, Sometimes you've got to have them sit down, you need to uh, give them timeouts, whatever it is. Those things are okay, but forcing the child to sit down in a chair now moves into the realm of child abuse. So we've got to be very careful. Restraining. Restra yeah, restraining is one of the things on here. Exploitation of a child for any reason, for personal benefit, uh, uh, even using a, a child as a gopher can uh, be interpreted or misinterpreted as uh, exploiting that child. Satisfying adult needs of any kind, absolutely out of the question. Adult physical force, this would include hitting, slapping, punching, pushing, so forth, but also, as Janice mentioned, uh, restraining. That would come under, uh, a little bit under coercion, but restraining a child is, uh, well, it's illegal for one, and it's not a good thing to do. Janice and I were uh, therapeutic foster parents uh, for a while. And the therapeutic foster program in Nebraska, and it's spread throughout the country now, uh, works with the, the most emotionally, physically abused children in the system. These are kids they usually used to institutionalize and wait till they turned 18 and they throw them out on the streets. Now these therapeutic foster programs work with the children and help them to, uh, to recover uh, as much as possible from the damage that was done to them. We had one uh, boy that uh, was in our home and he would uh, get violent and throw tantrums like you wouldn't believe. We had to get special permission from the courts to restrain him during those situations. Okay. If we had restrained them without that permission, we could have been arrested, charged with child abuse, and had been on the child abuse uh, uh, listings for the rest of our lives. So we never want to use any kind of adult force, including restraining. Excessive punishment or discipline, timeouts are okay. 
Uh, spanking is not. It's legal in North Carolina. Well, we're not in North Carolina. Okay. All right. Okay. Slapping, striking, beating, obviously out. Spanking. I had to check. See, that was on there. Spare the rod, spoil the child. We know. And I believe uh, every once in a while a child does need to have a good smack on the behind. Unfortunately, our uh, politicians and social workers in a knee-jerk reaction have gone too far the other way, and it is illegal in most states to, uh, to spank a child. Some states allow it under certain conditions, but I will tell you it is never appropriate for you to do it to someone other than your own child. Even if your parents say, if my child acts up, go ahead and give them a whack on the bottom, I strongly encourage you, don't do it. They don't usually mean it anyway. <laughs> Sometimes I mean, they, they don't. They do, but when it comes right down to it, they don't mean it. <laughs> yeah. So even if you have permission to spank a child, don't do it. Okay? It's just not worth the risk. Use regular discipline, timeouts, and that uh, type of thing. The best thing to do if you've got a, a rowdy child in a, a church setting is go get mom or dad. Let them take care of it. It's not your responsibility, really, to discipline the child or to try to get them under control. Call for the parents and let them deal with it. But again, even if they tell you it's okay, it is best not to spank. What you do with your own children, use uh, discretion, okay, especially in public. Any kind of pushing, shoving, uh, pinching. A lot of adults don't think that that's uh, really an issue, going up and pinching a child, uh, you know, pinch them on the back or the side and sometimes on the, the bottom. Um, the law says it's child abuse. Even if the kid says it's okay, the law says it's child abuse. These are things I'm not making up. These come out of the statutes and so forth of uh, most states in the country. Hazing, harassing, needling, picking on the child, making fun of them and so forth, out bullying. We know that's a big issue, especially in our schools. Sexual suggestions or innuendos, jokes of a sexual nature, suggestive gestures of any kind, showing pictures or movies containing sexually explicit material. All of these things are inappropriate and not allowed. Forced kisses, invitations or suggestions to kiss, again the little mistletoe, mistletoe episode. Uh, tickling. Uh-oh. <laughs> What's wrong with tickling? Some kids don't like it. Okay. And if you're tickling a child, you get into that kind of a situation, and they say, no, stop, you better stop. Okay. Even though it seems to be something innocent, doesn't seem to be hurting, the child is laughing. Well, they're laughing because they're ticklish. Okay. That does not mean they're enjoying it. And if they go and tell their parents that you were tickling them and it hurt, you're in trouble. So you don't want to put the child in that situation where they're going to feel threatened or uncomfortable, but neither do you want to put yourself in that kind of position either. Touching private areas, I think that is obvious. Um, the only uh, exception to that would be changing a young infant's uh, diaper, uh, but other than that, absolutely not. Fondling or molestation and violation of any of the laws. So these are things that are inappropriate touches and behaviors. Now, these things become especially important and a special concern when you're working with teenagers. And there's a number of reasons for that. The first is the teenage years are a time of turmoil and change. They're trying to figure out who they are, how they fit into this world, how they fit into the church, how they fit into the family. And they're struggling to find out their place in all of this. So there's a lot of confusion in their lives, and they don't even know what's going on what's within them. Only God does. So it's a time of turmoil and change, and they can be rather erratic and irrational sometimes. If you've had teenagers or work with them, you know. So they can come up with things or see things or perceive things or feel things that may not have actually been there or happened, and they become real to them. So we need to recognize that this is a time of turmoil and change. It's also a time of rebellion. There was a friend of mine that was involved in a different youth group, and uh, he was taking uh, three girls to this convention, 
and uh, was driving quite a distance. He was driving from uh, Kansas to uh, St. Louis and then on. I don't remember the final destination. Anyways, they drove to St. Louis. They stopped for the night. He got a motel room for the three girls and a motel room for himself. Everything's okay so far. Okay. When they got to the destination, one of the girls called her parents and said that he forced her to stay in his room that night and molested her. They investigated it. The investigation took a year. But in the meantime, this man was thrown out of the youth organization. The suggestions and innuendos moving around the workplace caused him to be fired from his job. He had a good reputation in the community, but that reputation went down the tubes. After a year, one of the other girls uh, notified the police and said that uh, this is what really happened. When they got to the motel, the girls wanted to go out and party, the teenage girls. The man said, no, you're going to have to stay in your room. We have to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning and uh, leave early so we can get to our destination in time. They got upset about it and went back to their rooms and fabricated the story. And all three of them collaborated on it. When he got back to Kansas, he was arrested. So it was done out of spite. It was done because they were rebelling against authority, simple authority, stay in your room, we've got to get up in the morning. Ruined this man's life, even though a year later, when the one girl confessed, and it all came out in the open, it was over. His reputation was ruined. So, um, teenagers do weird things, okay? Because they don't want us to be controlling them, they want to be in control of their lives, but the fact is they don't really know what they want in their lives is what it boils down to. But this is the important one. This is a time of change in role models. Little boy from toddler age up to uh, oh, probably uh, 12, 13 years old. Which of the two parents is he going to uh, spend the most time with? Little boy is going to spend the most time with dad. He's going to emulate dad. Even as a toddler, gets a toolbox for Christmas. So when dad's out working with his tools, the little boy works with the tools. Goes out and helps dad with the car, watches dad, learns from dad. This is the way God planned it. Little girls are watching mom. They're learning from mom. And of course, we've got different scenarios and a whole different situation in our culture now. Uh, with uh, We don't have a lot of stay-at-home moms like we used to. But the idea was the little girls would watch mom, would learn from mom, follow mom around, and mom would teach them all of the things that mothers do. But something happens when they reach their teenage years. They switch role models. And now the little boy begins to spend more time with mom. He begins to watch mom, how she relates to dad, watches mom uh, with uh, affection and so forth and emulates her all the way through to, well, even to 21 years old. The little boys, our little girls, start watching dad. They start getting closer to dad, they're hugging dad, they're getting, uh, sitting on his lap, they're wanting to go places with dad, and it's dad's little girl. And what's happening in God's plan is when they reach puberty, they need to start learning about the opposite sex. They need to learn in an appropriate environment Little boys, teenage boys, need to learn what is the proper way to relate to a girl. And all this is done in preparation for them to eventually meet a mate and, and marry. So in an ideal, functional family, the boy learns about women and how to treat women from mom. And the girls learn how to relate to man uh, through dad. Problem comes in with dads primarily, and even more now, uh, increasing number of women, teenage girl comes and hugs dad and sits on his lap and dad has some problems with self-control, he ends up getting himself into trouble. And that's because of this role change that takes place. So we need to be careful as teachers, leaders, uh, working with children, especially teenagers, if a girl is starting to just maybe be a little bit too friendly with me, then I need to be aware of what's happening in that situation so that she doesn't uh, cross boundaries and put me in a, a difficult situation. Same with a woman leader. If a boy is coming up and giving too much attention, 
We're seeing this happening in the schools where uh, teachers are being arrested uh, or fired for uh, child abuse. Men teachers, teenage girls, women teachers, teenage boys. And it's just more and more that this is, uh, is coming to light. And this is all because of, well, the devil is uh, corrupting what God had originally said with how children are supposed to learn and relate uh, to other people. So we need to be aware that that dynamic is taking place in their lives uh, so that we can be aware if we see something out of the ordinary taking place, okay? And we can take precautions of our own. But this is a God-ordained plan. It's worked for centuries. Unfortunately, the 20th century began to change that plan and uh, with all the uh, sexuality and so forth and television and whatnot, uh, all of those borders, all of the uh, learning experiences of relationships pretty much uh, down the tubes is what it uh, boils down to. Okay, some legal implications. This is just an excerpt from an article, uh, June 2008. When she traveled to China with her son's school choir, Teresa Cleary spent a fair amount of time worrying that a student under her supervision might become lost or ill. She didn't consider another possible consequence, getting sued. A nearly $700,000 verdict against a chaperone of a cheerleading trip to Hawaii is enough to give a chaperone pause, said Cleary of Cincinnati. Whether it's a trip to the zoo with first graders or a trip to China with a group of high school students, there is always an anxiety, she said. I'm responsible for someone else's child. Add legal liability to the equation, and I definitely think it could impact some people's willingness to chaperone. The Hawaii verdict came in the case of an 18-year-old high school student who fell to her death from a Maui hotel balcony. Did the chaperone have any control over this girl falling from the balcony? Probably not. She was probably not in the room. But the responsibility for that child was on the chaperone, and that's what the law looks at. And that's why we have a heavy responsibility as leaders, teachers of our children, that we take every precaution that we can, reasonable precautions, reasonable protection to protect the children so that this type of thing doesn't happen. But again, we also have to protect ourselves. This woman had no control, I'm sure, over this. Now, it would have been different if she allowed them to have alcohol and, you know, I mean, a whole different scenario. But this was a perfectly innocent situation. The girl was horsing around, she fell off the balcony and died. The jury awarded $700,000 against her. And there's a lot of crazy cases like that, unfortunately, in our era of litigation and uh, corrupt lawyers. I shouldn't say that, especially <laughs> since I'm on film. Um, it's the way it is, okay? Uh, people are out to get money for anything. And when it comes to the church, something happens within the church. Everybody knows churches have deep pockets, okay? But we don't. It's still God's money. Pardon? Taken from Grandma whoever. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Use common sense. That's the bottom line in all of this. Use common sense. Protect children, protect yourself in whatever situation you're in. Don't just go blindly into a situation. Have a plan. You know what's going to happen. If something unusual takes place, think about it, pray about it. That's a real good thing and ask for guidance on how to deal with it. But number one, protect the children, especially if it's a threat from outside, uh, and then protect yourself as well. So in all of these cases, you need to just simply use common sense. Reporting child abuse or neglect. This is an interesting uh, subject. You need to first look at who is required to report any kind of child abuse. And it varies by state. In Georgia, the following persons have reasonable cause to believe that a child has been abused, shall report, or cause reports of that abuse to be made as provided in this code section. Don't you love legalese? Mm -hmm. Physicians, interns, or residents, hospital or medical personnel, dentists, licensed psychologists and interns, podiatrists, thought that one was interesting, uh, registered nurses, licensed practical nurses, professional counselors, social workers, marriage and family therapists, school teachers, school administrators, and it goes on. And what we're looking at in Georgia are professionals. 
teachers, social workers, law enforcement, and so forth. Um, they don't list uh, pastors, but that's about it in the professional realm, okay? Any other person is also listed in the statute other than one specified in subsection C of the code section, the one we just looked at, who has reasonable cause to believe that a child is abused may report or cause reports to be made as provided in this code section. In Georgia, unless you are in a professional capacity that's on that list, you do not have to report child abuse. You may do it. I would suggest that you do. Okay? If you suspect child abuse, I suggest that you call Department of Social Services or whatever they're called in the various states. The social workers will come out, they'll investigate it. If it's uh, not substantiated, they'll dismiss it and uh, life goes on. But if it is, you have been instrumental in protecting a child from further harm. So, Georgia, I would suggest you do it, although, unless you're one of these professionals, you're not required by law. I love this one. Any person who has knowledge of or is called upon to render aid to any child who is suffering from or has sustained any wound, injury, disability, or physical or mental condition shall report such harm immediately if the harm is of such a nature as to reasonably indicate that it has been caused by brutality, abuse, or neglect, or that on the basis of available information reasonably appears to have been caused by brutality, abuse, or neglect. Persons required, physicians, osteopaths, medical examiners, it goes through all these medical people, other school officials or personnel, daycare center workers, other professional child care, foster care, residential or institutional workers, social workers, practitioners who rely solely on spiritual means for healing, judges or law enforcement officers, neighbors, relatives, friends, other persons. And I got curious what they meant by other persons. So <laughs> other persons in Tennessee is defined as any person who has knowledge that a child has been harmed by abuse or neglect must report. You get all that? I paraphrase that whole thing for you, okay? In Tennessee, everyone is a mandated reporter. In Tennessee, all persons must report actual and suspected child abuse. That would have saved them hours of committees and our tax money if they would have just done that, okay? <laughs> so, anyways, Tennessee, everybody's got to report. Okay? It's that simple. There are no exceptions. If you suspect child abuse, if you're aware of child abuse, and you do not report even your suspicions, you become legally liable. Okay. If a child is hurt or uh, killed, you could be charged with uh, a, a related crime. So we need to be very careful about that. North Carolina, any person or institution who has cause to suspect abuse or neglect shall report. All persons who have cause to suspect that any juvenile is abused, neglected, or dependent or has died as a result of maltreatment shall report. See, North Carolina's got it down. Real simple. Okay. And straight to the point. It's sensible to take precautions, but normal sunblock will do. You know, we're concerned about um, the ozone layer and the ultraviolet rays and skin <clears throat> cancer and so forth. There's overkill. Okay? You, can, you can overdo it. And the same thing applies in child protection. We can become so paranoid that we don't want to work with children anymore. We can become so paranoid that we are actually stifled in our ministry and in what we're trying to accomplish and the children aren't going to benefit. So let's not be, go overboard and get carried away to the point where our ministries are being impacted. We need to use common sense and uh, that's the bottom line. Use common sense when working with children. It's, uh, it's that simple. We have some handouts. Did everybody get a pack? <clears throat> the Child Protection, uh, which says Child Ministries Convention, a summary of some of the things that we had on the slides here. There's a statement on child sexual abuse from 2000, or 1997. There's a copy of that from the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. You can read that. There's also the Code of Conduct and Guidelines for Volunteers that the uh, General Conference produced and revised in 2005. Also a, a fairly new document from Georgia Cumberland Conference, Suggested Guidelines for Churches with Known Sex Offenders. If you have a sex offender in your church, the pastor needs to be aware of it, but uh, if you're working with children, uh, the church board needs to be aware of it as well so that uh, they can be watched. As I mentioned, the reason I 
started studying all of this and uh, learning what is considered child abuse is because in uh, another church district, uh, two different church districts, I had, uh, had to work with a member who was uh, arrested as a uh, predatory pedophile, had molested his nine-year-old daughter and was grooming a neighbor's girl. And another church, uh, a man that uh, was a family member of one of our church members, he was also a predatory pedophile. Uh, so these people are on the national and state sex offenders list. A lot of times we don't know some of the people within the church that may be on that list, and we do need to be aware of it. So there's some guidelines on dealing with these people by no means, under any exception, no matter how sweet and nice the person may be, should a convicted pedophile ever be involved in any children's program. It's that simple. Ever. Okay. And for their protection. I believe that the, the man that I was working with who was a member of our church, he went through uh, counseling and rehabilitation and so forth. And uh, a few years later, I mean, everything was fine. He seemed to have been able to deal with his issues that led to that. But when a young child comes up, five-year-old, and clamps onto his leg, um, all of those things begin to happen again. And when I saw that happen, I took him aside afterwards and sat down and I uh, said, you know, when so-and-so came up and hugged you, and he's, I didn't do it, I didn't do it. And I said, I know, I saw it, you know, she came up and hugged you, but how did you feel when that happened? He said, the same old stuff just started stirring back up in me again. Okay, this was like two years after he had gotten out of jail. So for their protection, but more so for the children, no known sex offender should be, or child abuser, should be allowed to work with children. And if you know of that happening in your church, go talk with your pastor about it. Okay? I don't know what the conference has to say about that, but that is my uh, experienced and educated opinion. How's that? Now, there's another one here, and I want to take just a couple of minutes to, uh, to look at it. Identifying the child predator. Do you all have that? Okay. These are some things that we need to be aware of because, as I said, these people are very good at covering themselves. They're very good at deceiving adults as well as children in order to uh, get the, uh, the power and control and the stimulation that they need. Some of the characteristics, they have a preoccupation with children. Now, some people love children. They work with children. They're around children. We're not talking about that. We're talking about somebody that spends too much time with children. Uh, they may be overly nice, kind, and friendly. In fact, they usually are. You'll think it's the greatest person in the world. Some of the uh, predatory pedophiles uh, are uh, influential people in the community. I mentioned the one who was an elder in an Adventist church for decades and had molested uh, about 45 uh, children over the years, including his own granddaughter. Um, it's sad, but... When the community and the church found about, they said, no way. False accusations, they're railroading him because this guy was so nice and a leader and so forth. But he did. When they found his computer, he had records of all of the children that he had molested. And that's very common with pedophiles. Uh, they may be seen by other adults as having a special gift in their ability to communicate with and be liked by children. So we don't let the fact that somebody just does really well with children uh, just to be brushed off lightly. I have one person that I've watched that uh, I think he's just immature, okay? <laughs> he never grew up, but he spends too much time with children. He hugs them and tickles them and so forth, and I had to sit him down and say, it's not going to happen, okay? Uh, but I was concerned because he was exhibiting some of the characteristics of a pedophile and had to be, uh, be aware of that. But uh, he has backed off on that, so I think it's just a fact, like you said, he said, he never grew up. They use clever means to gain access to and cross boundaries with children. Number five, they may attempt to court their next victim by showering him or her with gifts, money, and attention. Number six, they're overly attentive to a child. Pedophiles have radar for kids who come from broken homes and whose dependency needs are not getting met. Pedophiles gain a child's trust by giving them the attention he or she craves. Number seven is an important one. They may seek out single mothers as a ploy to gain access to their children. Uh, they often work in a position that allows them access to children. They can be teachers, coaches, scout leaders, pathfinder leaders, church personnel, and so forth. Number nine, they situate themselves in close proximity to children by volunteering with youth organizations or by otherwise frequenting places where children can be found. Uh, people that operate things like that are 
being trained to recognize when somebody stands out in those situations. Uh, number 10, they seek to lower the victim's inhibitions by assisting the child in changing his or her clothes, by sleepovers, by showing sexually explicit material. Photography may be a hobby and they may be seen as taking non-sexual photographs of children in public places. Uh, that is uh, kind of a warning sign. There are often, they are often victims of child molestation. Uh, 13, they're usually loners, have an inability to get their needs met from adult relationships. 14, they may have families of their own who are totally unaware of what's going on. Uh, 15, pedophiles will do everything in their power to earn your trust, so you'll assume that your child is safe in their care. That's an important one. Most pedophiles are men. It's estimated that only 4% of pedophiles are women. Don't let this prevent you from looking more closely at a woman who has your child, uh, who your child has reported feeling unsafe with. For those of you who didn't uh, see the beginning, let me run back here real quick. Okay. These work a lot better going forward. They were pretty cool going back to you. Okay, there we go. Melissa Huckabee. Looks like the girl next door. Somebody you trust. Would you feel comfortable with your child staying at her home or her babysitting you or your child? Looks fine, doesn't she? 28-year-old Sunday school teacher. What more could you ask for? Except she sexually molested and strangled eight-year Sandra Contu with a noose in a church in March of 2009. Uh, she just uh, was convicted here and sentenced uh, toward the end of 2010. More and more women are falling into this area of uh, child abusers, uh, sexual abusers, and pedophiles. So these things apply to women as well as men, is what I'm saying. Red flags down at the bottom. Uh, someone enjoys being with your child more than you do. A uh, much older child or adult spends excessive amount of time with your child. Your child has new toys or gifts that you did not buy. Your child speaks knowingly of places or activities that you did not introduce them to and so forth. So a resource sheet for you and uh, something just to be aware of some of those uh, behaviors. Well, we've got uh, a couple of minutes. Do you have any questions or comments? This is a heavy subject. It's not... Uh, not one of the more pleasant uh, ones that you want to do on a Sabbath afternoon, but it is uh, extremely important because of all that's going on out there. It's important that we protect our children. It's important that we ch protect ourselves. And it's important that we protect the church as well. Go ahead. I have a question. Did you touch any on other children as predators? I didn't touch on that. But other children can be predators, even prepubescent children. If they have been abused in their home, sexually abused, physically abused, whatever, they don't know boundaries. They don't understand that what was happening to them was wrong and it should never have happened. So if that's happening to them, they think that's okay, and they will end up doing that to other children as well, even if they've been, not thinking that they're doing anything wrong. Even if they've been told it's wrong, what they understand is what they experience, not what they are told. How do you deal with it? Who, who do you? Well, it has to be reported if they do it, because it's still affecting the younger child. When in what, doubt. What I usually do as a counselor in, in trying to get something reported is I will encourage them to do it with me there. If they refuse to do it, then I'll go ahead and do it. And I'll tell them that I'm going to do it ahead of time. Reporting. To report. When in doubt, if you have suspicions, whether it's a child or an adult that's abusing someone else, even a suspicion is better to report it and let the professionals investigate it and deal with it. Because they're more likely, when they get into that situation, they discover that this abuse is really taking place <clears throat> to get that child where he or she needs to be to get the help they need to realize that's inappropriate behavior. But yeah. Um, even young children, they've uh, put them in rooms and they filmed children that uh, four and five years old or even younger that had been abused and watch how they beat up and uh, hurt other kids. That's what they've been taught. That's what they think is perfectly normal part of life. Yes. Uh, on that subject, 
that subject. And both need help. The abuser and the abused child. Right. They both right. need help. Yes, sir. There are children that are like four or five years old that, you know, you know, some church members say, oh, I saw these kids kissing or whatever. You tell their parents, they're like, oh, that's not a deal. I mean, what's the deal? It's just they're little kids. They don't know. Um, <laughs> how would you respond to them? I would try to explain to the parents that, yeah, that is a big deal. It's inappropriate. If they're not receptive to it, then all you can do uh, with a young child like that is, uh, in your environment, class, whatever it may be, explain to them that's not the, a good thing to do here. It's not right, especially when they're that young. They're not going to be able to, to comprehend it. And it may be perfectly innocent. In fact, at that age, most likely is. Maybe they mom, uh, saw mom and dad kissing and... Uh, they're just acting that out. So at that age, it's probably okay. So I wouldn't make a big deal out of it at that age myself if the parents didn't think it was a problem. Well, but in your environment, you can say, we're not going to do that. Sometimes they'll, they'll get aggressive, not sexually acting out, but aggressive because of emotional issues in the home or because mom and dad never set the limits, never, you know, when a child just you know, under a year even starts hitting mom and then she allows it to happen and just continues to let it happen, it's going to continue until it stops, mm -hmm. you know. And then and some parents just don't understand that. You can't let a child of any age hit you. That doesn't mean you hit them back. You stop them from doing it, you know. Yeah. Well, we need to end, and uh, we'll be here for a little while. If you have some questions, you want to talk with us, uh, anything more about this subject. Thank you for attending. I hope this has been helpful. Um, share the materials that you have with other people in your church because we need to uh, protect our kids, protect ourselves, protect the church. God bless you and your ministries.